Good afternoon, everyone, and a happy April 1st to all of you. I'll restrain myself from any April Fool's jokes up here, but I do hope that you'll play at least one prank on somebody, some practical joke today, and find something to laugh about. On a serious note, today is National Census Day. You might ask, why do we need to proceed with a census right now? Don't we have bigger things to worry about with our battle against COVID-19? And here's my answer. Yes, we are in the biggest battle of our lifetimes against COVID-19, but it's important to look beyond this fight today and to take this moment to think about our future. It's incredibly important to make sure that every Illinois resident from newborn babies to great grandparents is counted in the census. The census is far more than just a survey. It will determine how much of your tax dollars we get back from the federal government, and it will help decide how much power Illinois will have in terms of congressional representation and electoral college votes for the next decade. Based upon our 2010 census count, the last time we ran a census, Illinois today collects over $34 billion per year in federal funding for vital services like education and business investment, child care, workforce training, transportation, and health care. But if we fail to count everyone in Illinois, it could result in the state losing over $195 million per year in federal funds for each 1% we undercount ourselves. I know people are anxious and worried right now about the COVID-19 pandemic. We are facing an invisible enemy, and there are a lot of unknowns, I understand. But I think this moment has also illustrated how connected we all are and how important it is that we keep the structural foundation of our, our society well-funded and well fought for. One of the best things that you can do to help our state in the long run, to help our doctors and nurses, our first responders, our teachers, our grocery store workers, our delivery drivers, and everyone else, is to continue to stay at home and take 10 minutes and fill out your census form online. I want to remind everyone that there is no citizenship question on the census. Let me repeat that. There is no citizenship question on the census form. You will not be asked your immigration status and your information will not be shared with anyone. At the federal level, the U.S. Census Bureau has temporarily suspended in-person interviews and postponed 2020 census field operations. So that's the right call for the safety of the Census Bureau employees census volunteers, and for the public at large. Here in Illinois, we're doing everything that we can to make sure everyone is counted. And because a lot has changed over the last month or two, our strategies have changed too. Our $29 million investment in the census this year is now being directed toward efforts like social media outreach and expanding our remote home-based phone banking texting and virtual assistance programs. And with help from our 30 local census hub partners across the state, we're modifying our targeted outreach to our hard to count populations, like rural communities, minority populations, blended households, young children, low income families, and college students, just to name a few. It has never been easier to respond on your own to the census, all without having to meet a census taker in person. You can easily complete the census while social distancing. Online, you can visit my2020census.gov, my2020census.gov, and fill out the census now on your computer, your tablet, or your phone. By phone, Call 844-330-2020, 844-330-2020 to fill out the census over the phone.
The U.S. Census Bureau offers assistance in 59 non-English languages, including American Sign Language. By mail, fill out the census form that you received in the mail and return it free of charge to the U.S. Census Bureau. So when you have an extra 10 minutes, take the time to fill out your census form. Let me also remind you that for those who want to uh, get a response by text, you have questions that you want answered, you can text to 987-987 and you will get an immediate response. You count, everyone counts. No matter where you used to live, no matter what language you speak, no matter how old you are, you count. And we are happy to have you in the state of Illinois. I also want to take a minute today to talk to you about health care. I've used this platform to describe the efforts that my administration is making to expand and simplify health care access for our residents in this time when every individual's health care is essential for our collective well-being. To further that effort, I joined Republican and Democratic governors in asking the federal government to open a special enrollment period of the Affordable Care Act to expand health care access to Americans during this period of unprecedented health challenges. We have at least 800,000 uninsured people in Illinois, over 500,000 of whom could potentially sign up for the ACA tomorrow if the federal government opened up a special enrollment period. Some White House officials are saying that the president will not be reopening the insurance marketplace in response to the coronavirus. Frankly, this is leadership malpractice. Now more than ever, we need as many people as possible to have access to health care, to seek out testing. If we're ever going to be able to fight COVID-19 and eliminate it as a major risk to our people. On that same note, the Trump administration's continued pursuit of a legal case to destroy the Affordable Care Act, which has provided health care to tens of millions of Americans, is a special insult to the people of this nation at this moment. To seek to kill the ACA at a time like this, not to mention ever, undermines everything that we're trying to do to keep people safe. For Illinoisans who were recently laid off because of COVID-19, I want them to know that they are eligible to enroll in the ACA right now anyway, because of a clause in the act allowing those experiencing a qualifying life event to enroll at this time. If that may be you, please visit our healthcare portal in Illinois called getcovered.illinois.edu, getcovered.illinois.edu. I also want to provide uh, an update on our search. Sorry, I want to give you that address again because I got it wrong. Getcovered.illinois.gov, getcovered.illinois.gov. I also want to provide an update on our search for new or renewing healthcare workers. We have now received over 1,100 applications from both former healthcare workers looking to rejoin the fight and from out-of-state professionals who want to help Illinois, many of whom are Illinois residents who happen to practice in a border city in another state. Right now, those numbers are running about half and half with more applications coming in every day. It's really incredible to watch. The people of this state are truly so deeply, genuinely caring. I want to remind healthcare workers already licensed in the state of Illinois to sign up for an emergency alert system so that in the event of an urgent need, such as those created by COVID-19, our public health officials will be able to contact you immediately to ask that you volunteer your critical skills at that moment. The website to register for that is illinoishelps.net. We're also hard at work exploring options to allow some of our fourth year medical students and nursing students at the end of their programs to join the fight against COVID-19. 
Finally, before I turn it over to IDPH Director, Dr. Ngazi Azike, I want to draw attention to an announcement that my wife, First Lady M.K. Pritzker, Chicago First Lady Amy Eshelman, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and I made this morning. The launch of a new relief fund specifically dedicated to supporting artists and artisans and cultural organizations impacted by COVID-19. This partnership among the City of Chicago, the State of Illinois, and our philanthropic community called the Arts Illinois Relief Fund has already raised more than $4 million to support grant programs for both nonprofit arts organizations and for individual artists, including stage and production members. Additionally, Arts for Illinois has launched a free online platform featuring performers and singers, poets, painters, writers, and other Illinois creatives who have made their work available for the public to enjoy while you're following our stay-at-home order. There are musical performances called Quarantine Concerts, features from children's theaters, and even the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Really, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Joining us today is Amanda Williams, a Chicago artist and an Arts for Illinois Steering Committee member, who will talk more about this program in just a few moments. Art has always been of incredible importance to me and to my family, but of course, so many of the usual ways of enjoying art together have had to be put on pause. And tragically, our creative communities have felt the financial hardship. When MK, who has always put others front of mind in any hardship, told me that she had an idea to support art and artists in the fight against COVID-19, I was really excited to see what she would come up with. Well, honestly, she's blown me away, and I encourage you to check it out for yourself. People interested in donating to the fund, artists seeking financial assistance, and those looking just to experience art remotely should all visit the Arts for Illinois website at artsforillinois.org. Thank you very much, and now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ngaze Azike. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Today, again, I bring sobering news with the report of 986 new cases, including 42 additional deaths related to COVID-19. That brings our total in Illinois to 6,980 cases and 141 deaths here in Illinois. Of course, we all understand that these deaths represent people's mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers and children and coworkers and neighbors and teachers. These are people that are no longer with us and we extend our heartfelt sympathy to the families that they represent. So many people are working so hard to help protect the health of Illinoisans. We salute our first responders, our military represented by our Illinois National Guard, our healthcare workers, the truck drivers who make sure that our stores are still stocked, sanitation workers, we're grateful for all of you. But I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the hardworking staff at the Illinois Department of Public Health. I stand before you each day providing data that our incredible team at IDPH has worked so diligently to collect, to investigate, and to analyze. I'm so proud to be at the helm of the agency at this time and alongside such a talented crew. Public health is like the stealth agency that flies under the radar. Our work is often invisible because of the illnesses and the injuries that we are successful in preventing through our work. But now, the whole world is getting a glimpse of the work that it takes to respond to a pandemic. We are running and running suspected COVID-19 lab specimens in each of our three state labs. We are tracking cases of COVID-19 throughout the state and every one of these devastating losses of life. We are tracking demographic data to keep ourselves honest and ensuring that equity and equal access occurs in, in, in testing. On a daily basis, IDPH collects hospital data on the number of beds and how many ventilators. Meanwhile, the nearly 400 babies that are born still every day in Illinois 
are still being tested at our labs for, for sickle cell or cystic fibrosis and the 60 plus other diseases on the newborn screen panel. We continue to monitor cases of tuberculosis, conduct surveillance for pertussis, Legionnaire's disease, and so many other infectious diseases. We're still processing and issuing birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates through our division of vital records. The work that we've always done can't be stopped. So IDPH has been working tirelessly. Team IDPH, I salute you. I'd also like to give a big shout out to all of the local public health departments who work hand in hand with us. They are our essential partners in our fight against this virus. The coming weeks are going to get more and more difficult as the number of cases and deaths continue to rise. But I'm not urging people to despair. Let's be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified, don't be discouraged. The courageous actions that we need to take are well within our grasp. And those actions are the ones we've been saying from the outset. Wash your hands, stay at home, clean frequently touched surfaces. All of these things seem minimal, but these are the courageous actions that are going to save lives and eventually end this pandemic. We are blessed to be under the tremendous leadership of Governor Pritzker and his talented team, not to mention all the state agencies and community partners and business partners who are all helping Illinoisans weather this unprecedented event. No, there's not a vaccine yet, and there's currently no specific treatment, although trials are underway. But what we do have is science telling us that social distancing works, and it's one of our best strategies to get on the other side of this unprecedented event. It is your behavior, it is my behavior, it's everyone's behavior that will turn this tide. We will see an end to this pandemic, and I thank you for your steadfastness. And with this, I will now uh, translate my comments in Spanish. Buenos tardes. Um, otra vez me llamo, es un gozo y que yo soy la directora de salud pública en Illinois. Tengo que anunciar 986 casos nuevos, incluyendo 42 muertes adicionales conectados a COVID-19. Ahora tenemos 6,980 casos y 141 muertes en Illinois. Es importante que recordamos que estos no son solo números, son personas. Son hijos, padres, abuelitos, maestros, etc. Queremos que sepan que los trabajadores de salud pública, los prof profesionales médicos y el estado de Illinois están trabajando día y noche para proteger su salud. Quiero reconocer los trabajadores del Departamento de Salud Pública de Illinois. Vengo aquí cada día para traerlos el dato que nuestro equipo de IDPH han trabajado duros para investigar y analizar. Estoy orgulloso de estar al frente del departamento en este momento y tener un equipo con tanto talento. Muchos no ven todo el trabajo que hacemos diario contra las enfermedades y heridas, pero ahora el mundo está viendo el increíble trabajo, trabajo que se necesita para responder a esa pandemia. Estamos recibiendo y analizando muestras del laboratorio de COVID-19. Estamos vigilando casos de COVID-19 y cada muerte. Diariamente recibimos información de hospitales sobre la cantidad de camas y cuántos ventiladores, todo eso. Mientras todo este trabajo está pasando, 400 bebés siguen naciendo cada día y seguimos haciendo pruebas importantes sobre su salud. Continuamos sig siguiendo casos de tuberculosis, vigilando la influenza y tosferina y muchas otras enfermedades. Todavía estamos procesando y emitiendo certificados de nacimiento y matrimonio a través de nuestra división de registro registros vitales. También me gustaría agradecer a todos los departamentos local de salud pública que son críticos en nuestra lucha contra este virus. 
las próximas semanas serán más difíciles porque el número de casos y los muertos vas a continuar a crecer. Pero no quiero que la gente se des desespere. Los funcionarios de salud pública están haciendo todo posible para detener la transmisión del virus, proteger la salud de los residentes y poner fin a esta pandemia. Todavía no existe una vacuna y actualmente no existe un tratamiento específico, pero lo que sí tenemos es que la, la ciencia nos dice que el distanciamiento social funciona. Entonces, lávase las manos, cúbrase la tos, lo más importante, quédase en casa. Como siempre, vamos a seguir luchando para Illinois. Espero que tú también lo harás. And with that, I am happy to introduce you to Amanda Williams, an Illinois artist with a very special message to share. Good afternoon. I'm Amanda Williams. I'm a Chicagoan, but today I come to you as an Illinois artist. Art matters, but artists matter. I'd like to give my heartfelt thanks to Governor Pritzker, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, for your relentless leadership during this pandemic and to thank you so much for your support that you've shown to the arts and cultural community today with the announcement of the Artists, Arts Illinois and Art for Illinois Relief Fund. Thank you. I'm here today representing tens of thousands of artists brilliant, talented, and passionate individuals across Illinois who have been separated from their livelihood as well. Exhibitions and performances for my friends and colleagues and for myself have been canceled. And I'm seeing firsthand how artists are hurting from this crisis. And it's not just visual artists that I'm talking about. Actors, musicians, dancers, choreographers, playwrights, lighting techs, costume fabricators, wig makers, carpenters, electricians, stage managers, box office staff, ushers, facilities workers, and the many more individuals and organizations that are immediately impacted when our theaters went dark, studios went silent, museums and galleries closed their doors. But arts and creatives are resilient. We too, in some ways, are the front line of being the bellwethers of these moments where we all have to come together as humans. We will not stop making, creating, inspiring, challenging, bearing witness, and bringing hope. In fact, that's all we know to do in these moments. We are here not just to ask for your support, but to also be part of the solution today in this moment of crisis. Even now, we're still creating and connecting, albeit virtually, and we're sheltering in place, and we need the arts now more than ever. Again, thank you to the state of Illinois and Governor Pritzker, the city of Chicago and Mayor Lightfoot, and the foundations and individuals who have already stepped up to provide financial support to my peers, the creative community during this time. I'd like to offer special recognitions to the Arts Alliance Illinois, which has been the leader in bringing together so many funders, artists, and partners to launch Arts for Illinois and the Relief Fund. I'm a member of the steering committee, and I'm there to make sure that the artist's voice is heard. This Relief Fund will provide immediate support to full and part-time creative community workers, as well as arts organizations through a grant process, which will be awarded to individuals by Three Arts and to arts organizations by Arts Work Fund. Individuals and organizations can apply through the Art for Illinois website, artsforillinois.org. Again, that's artsforillinois.org. We'd be remiss if we didn't thank all of the funders, including the City of Chicago's Department of Cultural Affairs, which has contributed $1 million to the fund, along with leadership gifts from the Walder Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, as well as funding contributions from the Albert Pick Jr. Fund, the Chicago Community Trust, the Elizabeth Morse Charitable Trust, Exelon, the Field Foundation, Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, 
Iris Har Irving Harris Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, Cassie Davis, Paul M. Angle, Angle Family Foundation, Polk Brothers Foundation, the Richard Driehaus Foundation, State of Illinois, and the Terra Foundation for American Art. And if you're tired after hearing that list, imagine all of the work that went into getting all of the entities and organizations and the understanding of how important artists and arts organizations are to the state of Illinois and to our society. There's so much need in so many communities across Illinois. We are all hurting, our country as well as the world. This fund is so deeply appreciated, but it's just the beginning of what is needed. My fellow artists, I speak to you now, and that my hope is that this emergency fund can help you keep your lights on or bridge you until the next uh, cell phone bill is due or to put food on your table. This is a crisis and we understand the severity, but our hope is that this provides some light, some beacon of hope. I know the uncertainty and pain you're feeling, but I hope we can all lean in on our generosity. For those of you wanting to help, you may also visit that site to make additional donations. In these unprecedented times, artsforillinois.org is not only a place to apply for relief or to make those donations, but also to be filled with art experiences generously made available by the creative communities and arts organizations that provide invaluable platforms for expression all the time in our normal lives. And if you're like my husband and I, who are now suddenly teachers homeschooling our two small daughters, this is an invaluable site to expose uh, your young ones and your loved ones to all the breadth of what the arts community can create. This is something for everyone, for every age, and new content will be added daily. If you're an artist interested in adding content, please also reach out. And with that, I'm gonna turn the podium back over to the governor for questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, and I'd be remiss if I didn't also add that um, in addition to Amanda's help and so many of the organizations that Amanda was calling out, I just want to acknowledge uh, Nora Daly, who's been a real leader in the arts in the city of Chicago, uh, who stepped up and was quite involved in helping to organize this and get something important done uh, for the artist community. So I know she didn't get mentioned in our remarks, but I, I just wanted to make sure that you knew how involved she was in that. So with that, uh, happy to take any questions from members of the And media. the governor is going to repeat the questions from the room so that everybody on the live stream can hear. I will. It is very hard to know, to be honest with you. I mean, I think you've seen that, you know, as I put in a stay-at-home order and uh, when we started with the uh, closing of schools and so on, you know, we were relying upon what we knew at that time, which seemed like it was just weeks, perhaps, that were necessary. Um, we're continuing to follow the science to know what date we ought to be extending to. There are states who have chosen different dates for their stay-at-home order. Um, and so I'm, you know, we're looking at all of that. If there was a definitive answer, I would hope that the CDC would put that forward to everyone. It's unclear, to be frank with you. Um, and so we're listening to the best minds that we can to get the right answer. Right now, we've extended our stay at home and all of the other orders to April 30th. But as I have said, we're gonna continue to evaluate every day whether we'll need to extend that at any point. But right now, I think that that seems like the right period of time. Again, not knowing exactly when we might peak or, and come off of that peak, which is a very important um, point at which we'll be making new evaluations. Uh, they could be contagious prior to knowing that they're, they're going to be 
Yeah, I appreciate Doctor, that. Doctor, can you try and repeat the first oh, question? Oh, sorry. And then we'll do that again. The first question <laughs> was uh, perspective. the perspective on the uh, heightened number of deaths. I think I think I have said. I hope I have said uh, every day that we knew we would see more cases and we s knew we would see more deaths. So as we develop more cases, we we are going to have more deaths. Um, I can't tell you, um, I can't predict exactly the number that it will be, obviously, each day. But we know generally following uh, data that we have from around the world, unfortunately, we have a lot of information uh, from all the situations, all the cases from around the world. We know that uh, approximately 20% uh, end up requiring hospitalization uh, and more more. Uh, more severe care, and that about five uh, five percent require ICU care. We know that the mortality rate is somewhere between maybe one and three percent. So I think our numbers are unfortunately going to bear that out, um, and we will see growth in the number of deaths. Most most unfortunately, until we get to that peak, and hopefully we have done uh, all that we can all that we can in terms of staying home and doing all these mitigation efforts so that the peak is lower than what was originally anticipated. Uh, an additional question was regarding the CDC's guidance. It was, they said 48 hours, you said three days. It was 48 hours um, potentially before onset of symptoms that you could potentially be transmitting uh, the virus. So of course, the best way to not get ill is to stay at home, right? It's to stay at home. It's to, if you wash your hands twice a day, you're doing a great job. If you wash your hands five times, ten times a day, you're doing an even better job. If you clean the frequently uh, touched surfaces. So all of these measures obviously are helpful. When we say cover your cough, the point of covering your cough is that you're not letting those droplets go on to the person standing in front of you, go on to the person that you're uh, in, in front of you. So the covering your cough, covering your sneeze, and the social distancing are essentially similar to the advice of wearing the mask. So the idea of wearing the mask, as you said, would be to keep, keep those droplets potentially from spraying on others. So I understand what you're saying, that that is logical. Um, and so we want everybody to do the most that they can to prevent you know, potentially infecting others before they know it. And we know that covering your cough, staying away from people, uh, and potentially some kind of covering of your mouth and nose would also potentially be helpful as well. We, we are working closely uh, alongside our public health uh, champion and federal partner, the CDC. Um, we know that we'll see they're looking at guidance now, and so we, we will be coming forth with our guidance as well. But these are very important issues that we're discussing and want to be you know, ahead of the curve in doing all that we can to protect the people of Illinois. Are the guidelines like out there, Governor? So, okay, so the information in terms of what is out there, in terms of what masks can do, show that, of course, if something is going to cover droplets and help prevent uh, you know, the spread of droplets, that that, that would be helpful. So um, we know that that is part of a mitigation strategy as well as staying home and social distancing, as well as washing your hands, as well as the infection control practices. So we know that not one practice alone will do it. We know that we need the full cache of all of these uh, practices. Everything will be additive, cumulative, in helping decrease, decreasing the spread and flattening the curve. Yes, so we had 127 that were tested. There are some test results that are still pending, but we did have a third, we sent some tests to different places, and so some of the tests are still pending. But bottom line, we had like 40, 45% of the tests that I have that are back were positive. We do have 19 uh, individuals that are hospitalized at different hospitals throughout the state. And we're working with area hospitals to make sure that if additional people require hospitalization, that they will get timely uh, transfer to a, a local hospital to get the services that they need. 19 in hospitals, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, the Stateville, Stateville. 
Yeah, sorry, 19 state film. Yeah. Well, we would certainly encourage people who are moving about the country, if they're coming home or they're planning to stay uh, here, that they should, in fact, stay at home and they should uh, try to self-quarantine. You know, we're not identifying people, marking them that they came from one particular place or another, um, because, you know, honestly, even though you might say that, well, someone from New York, there's a higher percentage, perhaps, of people from New York, the truth is that this this virus really knows no bounds. Um, you can come from anywhere and have it. Um, you can come from anywhere and not have it. Um, so we are encouraging everybody to stay home. I mean, that is really the purpose of the stay home. And I guess I want to add to something that uh, Dr. Zike said, um, that while the question about masks, is it effective to wear a mask? Um, sure, more effective than not wearing a mask. Um, but, but it does not replace staying at home. Staying at home is the best mitigation strategy, please. Stay home. Are you thinking of changing the Illinois policy with regard to masks or enforcing policy? Um, we're thinking about, you know, we're thinking about these things all the time. You know, what, what are the best strategies? We obviously look to the CDC to start with, right? These are, you know, these are tremendous scientists um, who, look, who have been working on these things for many years, you know, how viruses get transmitted and so on. We obviously have some terrific expertise right here in Illinois. So we sort of take the CDC and then we take the expertise that we've got in the state of Illinois, meld that together and try to come up with the best answer. Sometimes we're ahead of the CDC with the answers that we come up with. And so that's certainly something I would not discourage people from wearing masks. In fact, I think that there's some evidence to show that um, it can be effective. And are we thinking about changing policy? Again, we're evaluating these things every day. What are the ways we can tighten policy? You heard just the other day that we uh, gave guidance. We worked with the grocers to give guidance in grocery stores because we were seeing so many people packed together in a grocery store, people not uh, off, not always um, you know, following social distancing guidelines. And so the, the grocery stores did quite a lot. They put marks on the floor, many of them, showing what six feet is so that you could stay apart from one another and so on. I'm sorry, I haven't repeated the questions that I get asked. Um, I'm getting that, that from my press secretary over there. Um, but, but you know, we, we, are, we are constantly looking at uh, things like whether you should wear a mask, whether, you know, gloves are effective, how often you ought to be uh, wiping down surfaces. Uh, in your ho in your own home, people think, well, gee, I'm alone in my home, or I'm you know I'm worth the same people. Do I really need to wipe down those surfaces? Well, guess what? Everybody's touching different things, right? Um, and then they go and sit maybe in the same place they sat three hours earlier, but now you've got things on your hands, perhaps that you're transferring to surfaces and may not realize it, or someone else transferred it to a surface in your home, and you're now touching it, and then you touch your face. So it's just very important that people wash your hands wipe down surfaces, you know, follow our social distancing guidelines when you go outside and so Okay, we gotta get to some questions. Yes. We gotta get to some questions from um, online. From online, yes. Reporters who right. are social distancing. Yes. Are you considering taking action to delay the deadline for the second installment for property tax payments currently around August 1st, or do you think that is one deadline the state cannot afford to push back? Um, that is not a state function, uh, to, just to be clear. This is a, um, you heard the question, everybody. So the, uh, the, the fact is these are functions of local governments and, and county governments. State does not collect property taxes, and those decisions will get made by local governments, county governments. Would you encourage them, though, yeah. to delay any property taxes? Because, you know, we got uh, landlords who would be asking all time, all time, you know, they have to start paying the rent. But the landlords, they're, you know, asking them to buy from them every couple of months. Well, all I can say is we've made changes, obviously, at the state level to, you know, we've moved back our income tax date, uh, due date to July 15th. We've, you know, given people who owe sales taxes to the state and local governments some leeway there, a couple of months, and so on. So, you know, I think those will be decisions. A lot of it has to do with the local county and city governments and whether they can function without the cash flow that comes at that time and how they would actually get, uh, get that done. Director, can you please explain the numbers in a more clear fashion for people on the cases at Stateville? And then there are also questions about what the National Guard is doing at Stateville. 
so we had we have tested 127 individuals 80 of those samples were sent to a university lab another 47 were sent out elsewhere um, of the 80 that we were able to get back uh, we had 44 36 were positive uh, which gave us about a 45 percent positivity rate we have 19 uh, individuals who are hospitalized and at multi at different hospitals uh, throughout the state and we're continuing to monitor uh, other individuals that are still in the facility and i'll turn it over to brigadier new Hey, good afternoon. Uh, the question concerning what the National Guard's uh, doing to support the state bill uh, penitentiary is really, we're, we're providing about 30 individuals, uh, primarily medical technicians, that will be able to support um, establishing tents that will be able to separate out uh, the inmates and provide them a little bit more uh, distancing and to kind of quarantine them off into a different area in the, in the prison. Uh, those tents will be uh, supported by uh, National Guard medical technicians. We're also providing some uh, support within the actual uh, penitentiary with the uh, both visitors that are coming in as such as vendors and that, making sure that we're doing uh, uh, health checks before they come into the prison, uh, as well as employees that are returning every day. And so we'll be assisting out in, in those areas, just really augmenting that staff that's been kind of depleted the last several days uh, due to due to the flu and the COVID-19. Well, what they're looking at is, uh, I believe one of the scenarios is to actually put the uh, tents into the gymnasium uh, area, and then that way the we could put eight patients um, at a time into those tents, and then um, that way they get them out of the general um, infirmary area and kind of segregate the COVID-19 patients away from the rest of the uh, uh, rest of the patients, and then, uh, then we'll be able to monitor them more closely, uh, watching their uh, temperatures real closely, and if they need additional help. We may. Yes, uh, Brigadier General Richard Neely, the Adjutant General for Illinois. Thank you. The best Adjutant General in the country, I might add. <laughs> Well, all I can say is we're, we're working fast and furiously. As you know, there have been an increase in the number of people who are eligible for SNAP benefits. Um, but, but suffice to say that, that to the extent there's any delay, I'll make sure that I work with my staff so that we address that. I and mean, we understand how vitally important it is, you know, unemployment, uh, SNAP benefits, WIC. Uh, these are, you know, pe people are already on the very edge of um, you know not being able to survive really and so we want to make sure we do it as fast as possible so here on the first of the month um, you know to the extent people are not receiving that i want to know about it and we're going to make sure to address it governor 12 of the 52 states contain seats on the one state run facility there what do you say to the families who feel that the communications breakdown inspired this strike within that facility or to the families who feel that they're being put at risk because of what they see as lack well, we've provided, um, not only do we have a, actually a very strong PPE policy, but we also provided significant amounts of PPE. Um, look, there is no doubt, and you've heard this from uh, our medical experts, that sometimes congregate facilities are difficult because of the, you know, the very nature of people living in the same uh, facility. But, um, you know, as you know, we've provided uh, some folks uh, to you who are engaged in that facility uh, and uh, who have felt like, you know, we are actually running it reasonably well, um, doing the right things at the right time. Sometimes, you know, the, this virus is so, it's an invisible virus. You know, you just don't know where it's going to come from. We're doing everything we can to try to separate people out um, who may have contracted the virus to detect it. You just heard um, General Neely talk about, you know, taking temperatures and checking people's medical uh, situation before they enter a facility. We're trying to do that in as many places as we can. Um, so, you know, we're doing doing the best we can. We're, we're certainly trying our best to take care of our, our seniors, our children, um, people who are, you know, in our care uh, as prisoners too. 
Um, so we're, we're addressing it as best we can. And again, um, in each of these situations, our number one concern is the welfare of the people who are in our care. And so again, we're, we're providing all of the facilities that we can and all of the PPE and supplies that we can in order to address these challenges. Reporters in the room, I'm working on behalf of yeah. your colleagues, <laughs> so I'm gonna try and get some of their other questions in. We may not have as many confirmed cases downstate, but already clusters of cases in a senior home in Taylorville outnumber the available number of ICU beds at the hospital in town. What is your administration doing to coordinate the response in rural areas with critical access hospitals? And should county officials make those numbers of available ICU beds public? So our ICU bed situation in the state, you know, we, we actually are, um, you know, as you know, this is as we move toward the peak of this, uh, we are going to be filling up ICU beds across the state. It isn't the same in every area. There are critical access hospitals that may have fewer ICU beds. Um, there are you know, other hospitals in other areas of the state that may have more availability just as a percentage of, of what they've got. So, um, so as far as uh, nursing homes and, and making sure that we're providing you know, the right care in the right places, we are working really expeditiously um, with all of the hospitals. Whenever there is, whenever they're moving toward filling up all of their ICU beds or filling up all of their available um, beds across a, a whole hospital, um, we're trying to make sure that we're either offloading the non-acute uh, uh, people who are in the hospital, the patients in the hospital, or um, we're providing uh, additional facilities for people uh, to, to have, you know, ICU capability. So with regard to nursing homes, you've heard, I mean, these are challenging situations. So what we do in nursing homes typically is if the nursing home will allow the separation of people who are COVID positive from people who aren't, in other words, literally in separate wings or in separate floors, uh, we're attempting to do that. Um, and certainly there is a quarantine going on in many of these facilities to make sure, and PPE that's been distributed across the facilities um, to make sure that we're keeping people as safe as possible. It is hard, as you know, in a nursing home situation to move some people. Um, they are just because of their current medical condition. Um, and so again, trying to isolate those who are not sick and don't have COVID-19 from those who are sick and do, um, you know, is something that we're, again, working at constantly all the time because we really don't want to make sure that the infection doesn't spread. Who is going to staff the McCormick Place facility if it's needed, and are you getting the numbers of healthcare professionals you need to staff the 3,000-bed facility? Well, let me say just broadly, you know, there are not enough healthcare workers in the workforce today. So if you have the capability, if you are somebody who is nearing the end of your medical training, uh, whether it's a nurse or a doctor, if you're somebody who is has been uh, inactive but had a license at one time, um, and if you're somebody who lives in Illinois but but uh, works in another state as a healthcare professional and are willing perhaps to do some of your work here in Illinois, we need you. So that is my broad answer. With regard to McCormick Place, we have uh, been in process of attracting um, some of those healthcare professionals, exi uh, uh, taking existing professionals who work with contracting entities. There are companies out there that have healthcare professionals that are on contract with them, and they actually contract groups of healthcare professionals to organizations just nor in normal times. And so we've done some contracting with them in order to staff what we need at McCormick Place. Once again, we have, we believe that we have enough to staff the first 500 beds, which will be coming online uh, this coming week, or during this week, I should say. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we have some for the remaining beds, but we need more. There's no doubt. Is there a list of locations where people in Illinois can get tested? Um, I actually don't know what if there are lists I know I know we have drive-through facilities but remember that the way to get tested is you have got to contact your healthcare professional right whoever that may be or if you don't have one that's like your doctor you can certainly contact the the um, uh, Department of Public Health in your county to find out where you how you can connect with a healthcare professional and over the phone determine what the symptoms are and whether or not you would qualify and then sometimes get a flu test or some other viral test 
other than a COVID test because they're so limited, the number of COVID tests. So uh, once that happens, you would get, uh, you know, essentially a slip to go get either in a drive through facility or in a hospital or even from your own doctor, a swab taken. Because remember, where your swab is taken and where the test is actually um, you know, determined whether you have it or not are often in different places unless you happen to be at a hospital. Are you considering calling the General Assembly to meet someplace else or to meet virtually? So uh, the General Assembly leaders are talking about how they might be able to accomplish a General Assembly uh, legislative session. Um, it is something that I think may be very important to do. It's hard to do. There are 177 members of the General Assembly and we're asking people to stay home and not congregate in groups of more than 10. So um, uh, some governors might think this is a dream that you can't get your legislature together. Uh, but we have things that we need to get done in the state of Illinois. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to figure out how we might be able to get them uh, uh, meeting and I know that the leaders are thinking about that as well. How would you recommend churches handle Easter Sunday services? Well, I would suggest um, that many people will need to attend services online, um, that the churches should try their best to provide uh, a connection on the internet. Um, it's, it may be the best way in order to um, make sure that you're abiding by the stay at home rule which is so vitally important. I understand how important worship is, and especially in these moments, um, but it can be done virtually. Um, and I would suggest that people should never, you know, despite the desire on Easter to get together, to celebrate together, to worship together, I would still tell people, please stay home, please stay home and contact your, um, you know, your pastor uh, to find out if they have services online that you can participate in or at least view. All right, this will be our last question. Have you been in contact with the legislative leader, leaders and budget committee chairs to talk about a revised FY21 budget and what, if any, major changes from your original budget proposal do you think the state will need? Oh, I don't think I could list all the changes that would need to be made to the original budget. Um, our budget proposal was uh, put together in January, presented in February, um, and, and you know, weeks and weeks before um, the COVID crisis came upon us, or at least we were all aware of how serious it was. Um, so uh, there's, I have had conversations with various members of the General Assembly and leaders um, just to begin, you know, we, we are obviously working on our end to figure out what is the revenue shortfall? What, what are the challenges that we're gonna go through? When do we think that we'll begin to see revenue return? You know, and trying to make estimates of that, as you can imagine, at this moment are very difficult when I can't even tell you, you know, I couldn't tell you two days ago that we were gonna extend the stay at home uh, uh, rule that we put in place. So, um, so we're still working on it, there's no doubt. And it will be a vastly different budget, there's no doubt about that right. as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.